he burst onto the music scene as the demon in the band he co-founded, KISS. He ranks number 12 in Roadrunner's 50 Best Front Men in Metal History and has been nominated for induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. While he's still a respected musician, he's also become a successful businessman and a reality TV star, with such hit series as My Dad the Rock Star, Mr. Romance, Rock School, and Gene Simmons Family Jewels. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with rock and roll legend Gene Simmons. excitement of touring ever end? It's nice to see you. And it's good to see you, I'm too. I'm Gene Simmons. <laughs> I'm Ernie Manus. You're a powerful and attractive man. Well, thank you. So are you. Is the, well, that's true. Yes. Is the excitement of what? Touring ever end for you. No, touring is fun. It beats flipping burgers. You know, we, uh, we're very, very fortunate. 38 years after we started on the four knuckleheads on the streets of New York, walking down the street and having this great idea, you know, the sort of the what-if syndrome what if we put the band together that we never saw on stage? What if there were no rules? What if you could fly through the air 50 feet up into the sky? What if the entire drum platform, all three tons of it with explosions, lifted up into the air? What if Paul flew off the stage to the back? Of what if, the what if, the sense of wonder thing? Actually, if you say what if long enough, you could make it happen. It's a lot of hard work. So 38 years after we started on our first tour, here we are with 3,000 licensed products, everything from Kiss condoms to Kiss caskets. We'll get you coming, and we'll get you going. <laughs> I've used that before. That's a good line. But take me back then. What gave you the power to say what if? How did you know? What put you in the position to be able America to do that? America does. America is the best place for the dreamer, because there are no limitations, because culturally we're not stuck with the notion of what our parents did. Uh, the difference between Europe, for instance, the last bastion of power, and America, the new bastion of power, and it's still new, is the notion of the entrepreneur, that the great advances in mankind were created by individuals, not corporations, and by not royalty, but you know, the regular uh, person on the street. Two brothers who had a bicycle shop literally invented flight. That's in America. Not in New York, in Kitty Hawk. Not by a corporation, just by two brothers. And whether it's Alexander Graham Bell or Edison, who, this light that's on that changes darkness into light, is not actually biblical. It wasn't God doing that. It's just some guy who kind of said, how come? Or what if? And whether it's the internet or television or movies, cars, on and on and on and on and on, really comes from individuals, people with ideas who sit around going, what if? Okay, then take me to the next step. A lot of people dream. What gave you the, the wherewithal to make those dreams reality? Well, I come from a working class background. Uh, my father left us when I was about seven years old, and I saw my mother get up every day and go to work. 7 a.m. till 7 p.m., six days a week, not five. And I saw firsthand how hard it was to make a buck. And, you know, what's interesting is that uh, kids in America are raised with allowances. Here's your money for the week. That's not how life works. So we have two kids. They've never gotten a penny. You do something, you get something the way life works. Here's your money for the week. And when you grow up and your mom and dad stop wiping your butt for you, you're kind of going, okay, where's my money for the week? This notion of entitlement, which is why, as you can imagine, politically I have all sorts of notions about governments of entitlement. Yeah. I'm, I'm against a socialistic political point of view. But in your own life, so you decide that you can do this and you get out there with hard work and perseverance. What do you think it was, though, that you folks presented as KISS, as yourself, that made America connect? Why did it work for you guys? 
Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. We can sit here and wax prolific about all sorts of notions, but there is a peculiar, perhaps it's scientific, notion of the right thing at the right place and the right time, a sort of a tipping point, if you will, when the right idea hits the public at the right time and when you have as many people as possible there. So um, at the core of it, we're just playing guitars. But if KISS would have done, and that works, there are a lot of people that play guitars that make a living, but if we would have done that at the same time that uh, the Great Alaska, or Seward's Folly in the late 1800, in the 1800s, learn your lessons in school, when the gold rush was happening in the 1800s, and we went, bam, 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 bam. They'd go, what is that? That's noise, get out of here. And even the visual wouldn't work. So if you take the take the Beatles, stick them into the 1700s, they think it was noise. Right. Part of it is luck, a lot of it is hard work, and some of it is the what if. Yeah, the staying power then. What staying power means take? hard work. Staying power means uh, every day you get up and you try to, to stay away, stay ahead of the pack, and sort of march to the beat of your own drummer. This notion that uh, Music becomes homogenized. In other words, there are lots of successful rappers that have short careers. Because if you can replace one rapper for another, you're done. Mm -hmm. The more unique you are in what you do, the better your chances of continuing on. So when you take a look at bands, sometimes it's musical, take a look at a band like ACDC. You hear it, you immediately know what it is, that's what they serve up. You want ballads, go to another band. They serve up straight up. That's what you do. Kiss serves up spectacle. We will not sit around on stage on a Persian carpet, light <laughs> candles, and sing about, oh, the flaxen-haired lass on the English countryside. Kill me now. <laughs> we don't do that. You know, you want nice quiet, stay at home with Grandma, pour another glass of water and put her false teeth in it. Let the spinach rise to the top. That ain't what we do. We blow stuff up with a drummer and a backbeat. And uh, don't sing about the secret of life, because there is none. Here's the secret of life. You're alive, and then you're not. That's it. That's the secret. <laughs> Be glad you're alive. While you're alive, you're allowed to shake the world up a little bit. And that's what you do. But at the core of it, what we do isn't intrinsic to life as we know it on planet Earth. It's really not important. What you do is not important. What I do is not important and neither what you do is important. Unless you are covering a news event, that would make us important. Uh, PBS, it's not really important, nor is rock, nor is pop culture, except for the fact that this thing of leisure time and giving people a chance to just stop doing the same thing every day, because most jobs are routine, what PBS does and what KISS does and what we do is it gives you time in your leisure time, because we have more and more leisure time, to get into the what if. So when you see Nova and programming, that kind of makes you wonder and think. It's that next person who's going to become the next Carl Sagan who initially read science fiction in his leisure time and then became a professional and started to open up the gateways of what if. And... Uh, Actors can become presidents of America and bodybuilders can become the leaders of the fifth or sixth largest economy on planet Earth. That was California. And you don't have to speak English well either. You can be Schwarzenegger, and I couldn't speak English well at all. So the landscape is really fraught with sort of a no-rules landmine of stuff. Because, because there are no rules, there are a lot of casualties in ideas, but the ideas that survive, survive forever. Mm -hmm. Sense of community, how does that fit into all of this? Well, I'm an only child, so I've never really uh, connected, sort of, I'm a kind of a distant guy, except privately, uh, when I watch TV or when I hear my mother talking about life and the hardships and stuff, you know, I, I get very emotional about it and realize that there but for the grace of God, I'd be asking the next person in line, would you like some fries with that? And that 
who we are and where we are and where we come from is all an accident of birth. So we're lucky to have been born in Western culture and the rest of the world isn't so much. So because I have the means as a private citizen, I go out of my way to try to make other people's lives a little bit easier. But I refuse to do what other embarrassing celebrities do, which is to stand and do press conferences and hold up a nice big photocopy of a check they gave. Look, I give to charity. It's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. And they do it all the time. I know it comes from a nice place. I'm glad the money goes to somebody. But the idea that you get a free ride so that your ego is satiated and you can show people what a philanthropist you are is embarrassing. It's like, I like anonymous. It doesn't matter who gives you the money. just Because the idea of charity in and of itself is an embarrassing situation. Somebody gets some money so that you can live that week, and then you, they owe you something. They feel indebted. Thank you so much for it. The, and they have to bow and do all this kind of stuff. So take that away. I'm also less a fan of charity and more a fan of hard work. I don't want to give somebody money. I want to give them a job. Mm -hmm. You do a job, you don't have to thank anybody. You earn that money. When you talk about earning money, one thing that a lot of people cite is the merchandising and the idea of branding KISS and how, how you put it out into the marketplace is really what held on and made you the most successful part of all of this, is that you put KISS in everyone's lives, in a way. Well, you know, uh, we all get uh, credit for things we don't do, and I'm a lucky guy. I have a... I'm very lucky to have a partner whose name is Paul Stanley, who's, you know, we've been together for 38 years, and could I have done it alone? No. Could he, could he have done it alone? No. It always takes, I mean, I don't want to go into the cliche, it takes a village and stuff, but everybody's got different uh, fields of expertise or passions, areas that they will work harder for, and mine is in the second word. See, most people think it's called music, but it's actually, if you believe in truth and advertising, it actually says music business. The word business is right up there, right next to music, and or show business. Uh, and there is no business like show business, like no business, <laughs> I know. Da, 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 da. And so most of the people that play guitars and play in bands aren't really qualified to do very much of anything. And as soon as the guitar strap breaks and the guitar falls to the ground and their career is over, this is not going to be a high-earning guy. So, but that's their responsibility. While you're in the seat of power, it, it's your responsibility to uh, educate yourself, find out the way structure works, find out what due diligence means. I mean, these all sound like big words like gymnasium, but... It's still your responsibility. And for the first time in history since the Gutenberg Bible, the intelligentsia and the royals weren't the only ones who held the power of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Everybody has equal access. You can, come, you can be the lowest earning person and you can be Carlos Slim, who's a Lebanese immigrant to Mexico, who's not Mexican at all, but is the richest man in the world today in a country that doesn't have problems with monopolies. But that's another story. <laughs> that's how you become the richest, yeah. by being a monopoly. But uh, what it really means is that no matter how much you earn, no matter how much you know or don't know, you can have the same access to power that the high-end people have. And that means you have the ability to keep pushing yourself up. But how do you know what's right to create for, in a sense, the merchandising word. How do you know what's going to work, what's not? Where have the uh, successes You don't. Lied? You don't. You learn to listen. People will tell you what they like, which is why it's an, there's an interesting uh, example of what I'm talking about. Steven Spielberg, who I've met and uh, listened to, obviously, is the most successful filmmaker of all time. He makes, every single one of his movies has made at least $100 million, without fail. Nobody has equal that record. And he's done everything from Jewish concentration camp stories to aliens from other worlds. 
to color purple, to all kinds of stuff. Every single one is made 100 million north. What he does is he makes a movie his way. He's also part owner of DreamWorks. Nobody's going to tell him what to do, how to think, how to edit. But he does a strange thing. After he gets his movie exactly the way he wants it, he will take his movie and go to Ypsilanti, Michigan, and he'll sit down with people who are completely unqualified pretty much to do anything, especially tell him how to edit his movie, and he will listen to them with what's wrong with his movie. They'll say, I didn't like the ending, I don't like that person, I don't like that actor. And then he goes back and he changes it. He listens to the most unqualified people because ultimately you, PBS, KISS, everybody is in one business, the people business. And no matter what we think of them, whether they're the great American you know, uh, populists or the unwashed masses, you can make any point of reference you like. They are the bosses. We just work here. And where does art fit into this? Art is, uh, from my estimation, should be the name of a guy. <laughs> and that uh, anybody who calls what they do art should have a sign that says, shut up. I don't have the right to say anything about what I do. It's up to them to tell me if it's art. You can do anything you like, but you're not the one that determines if it's art. They do. So throwing up on a canvas is throwing up on a canvas. But if they decide it's art, then it's art, but not then you. Musically, where do you follow your heart and mind to make it your creation as opposed to a focus group telling you what works and doesn't work and what you part, should do? Part of it is a focus group. The idea of just uh, doing whatever you want to do, whoever tells you that is and, and successful is really t not telling the truth. We're all aware when we play songs to our friend, hey, I just wrote a new song or I just did a new program. We're all aware what people like and what we don't like. And because we're social animals, we prefer to be liked than not liked, those of us who aren't sadomasochists. And even sadomasochists who want to be hated want to be hated by more people than less people. <laughs> So all of us, are, you know, we react, and there is no solitary. No man is an island is actually so. Nobody just does it for themselves because you need the feedback because ultimately we want to communicate with other people. Well, I'm also curious when you decided to go into the reality show business area because I'm wondering how much do you, you even said early on, you know, you're not a public person in that way, letting cameras come into your home, filming your life, how much do you let, be real, and how much do you keep for yourself? It's uh, pretty, pretty much what you see is what you see. We have to keep them out of the pooper, otherwise they'd follow me in there too. Yeah. And you don't want anybody to see no. that. No, <laughs> it's, it's a horrific sight. Do you enjoy the experience, though, of being sure. not, not being in the pooper, but having the reality show? Of course. We are now the longest-running celebrity reality show of all time. We're up to 140 or 150 shows. But it's an opportunity for me to show some of the other brands that I'm involved with. So when I do a new venture, I mean, we have a, an entity that lends high, high net worth individuals as much as $300 million. You have to qualify, you have to be multiple seven-figure uh, earning and liquid and so on. And we lend them money at uh, flat LIBOR plus some banking fees, but certainly the cheapest money out there which has nothing to do with strumming guitars or sticking my tongue out. And we have other ventures as well, but I used our TV show as a kind of a here's who I am off stage and look at the cool stuff I'm involved with over here. It's kind of an infomercial as well. Yeah. I think that's the thing people will be most surprised with is that your life is not just music, that there is so much more to it. There are so many other but, elements But all get of in. us. I mean, when you take off your nice jacket and he stops rolling the camera, you go back and you do other stuff. None of us are one-trick ponies. But I would say the success in my life where most of my effort has been put is into the television so career. So far. Ah, good point. But the drive to continue is what fascinates me. Well, I think that has to do with personalities. There are eight types and so on. There are Most people are afraid of getting up on stage, and uh, and I'm not. I like being judged. Uh, you you have to have a loose screw, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Be a certain kind of personality. 
you know, and the, the little boys are on one side of the room and the little girls on the other side of the room and they put the music on, there's going to be that first boy that crosses the room to ask that first girl to dance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what did your mom think of all of this? I'm an only child, so I'm the king. Yeah? Anything I want, anything I do. I uh, have a funny story. You know, in the days before cell phones and everything, we, we, we were very poor. There was one phone in the house. And I'd come back from work because I, I always worked, and I'd run right into the bathroom because I wouldn't want to go in public. And so all my friends would call at the same time. The phone would start going. And my mother, in her thick Hungarian accent, would say, the king cannot come and talk to you. He, he is on the throne. <laughs> and she would laugh. My mom. Now, that's, that's a reality show all by itself. Yeah. What did she teach you about life? And I ask that because of what she experienced. And you yeah. mentioned the Holocaust. How does that then translate to a child? How did you understand where she came from? Well, I will tell you that uh, my mother should be teaching everybody about life because her perspective is perhaps the most profound notions about life I've heard and I've read the existential philosophers and Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Kant and you know what it is, who we are, what does it all mean and all this kind of stuff and my mother is very succinct by the way that's the correct way to pronounce that word not succinct it's like success, succinct uh, in her own words, translated from Hungarian, which is her native language, every day above ground is a good day. You wake up, you're alive, you win. That's all there is. So we all complain about traffic jams. I had a bad hair day. In my case, I always have a bad hair day. I love being everything. So even though I can buy this building, I don't wear the accoutrement, the, the jewels and the bling. Uh, my best bling is me. And that's what she teaches. Very softly, without preaching. Because the fact that my mother still believes in humanity, after having been treated like that by the animals, where an entire nation went insane, the entire population of Germany went out of their minds in World War II and was capable of horrors that we never dreamed of, the fact that she still believes in the goodness of humanity is the greatness of my mother. She's better than I am because I would never forgive. Mm -hmm. How do you think you do that, though? It, it's part of your DNA. I, uh, that's what makes my mother great. She happens to be my mother, but this is uh, as great a human being as ever walked the face of the planet. Yeah. How do you impart those lessons onto your children? Well, for one thing, uh, never negotiate with kids for three reasons. They don't have life experiences. Anything that they do that's a mistake, they don't have to have the repercussions for. And most importantly, I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> that's really it. Yeah. So no drugs, no booze, no nothing. Work hard. Do well in school because that's your job. You don't have any other job. You must do well in school. Behave. Just the, the ABCs of being a good person. And then when you leave us, you're on your own. But don't come to me if you mess up. Yeah. When you say no drugs, I think a lot of people are still surprised by that, that there is such a separation from the ultimate rock band to the lead guy having nothing to do with drugs. Well, if you take a look at the two guys that did use drugs and alcohol and stuff... They've gone, chapter 11, three times. They've been thrown out of the band three different times. Uh, there's no secret. You can't run a long-distance race with your vision or anything impaired. You just will not last. So other than the dentist's office, I've never been higher drunk in my life, Period. But that's a choice. Never tempted. Never in the heyday of Well, but when you take a look at a drunk, what uh, the girls are, oh, he's drunk. Let's all run to him. Oh, I can't wait to see what he's going to say. <laughs> yeah. Body appendages don't get bigger because if they would, I would 
I might try it. <laughs> Appendages don't get bitter. Your brain doesn't increase in size. There's no vitamins, no minerals. Nothing happens. If you're drunk, you throw up on somebody's shoes. You smell like poop. Costs money. You're never going to say anything witty. The next day, your head's going to hurt. It costs you money, and you smell like a garbage pail. Drugs is even worse. So what? tell me what about it works. Yeah. If you can show it to me, I might consider it. Last thing before I let you go, what's next for you? Is there a big game plan? The big game plan is to, to go where I've never gone before. I'm a rat that knows this maze well. I can get to the cheese pretty fast. If you go tonight, you'll see 70,000 people here who are going to have the time of their lives with a very limited show because we're not allowed to bring our full show here. But we'll shake it up a little bit. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. It was a pleasure to talk to me. <laughs> a pleasure. Gene Simmons. Now get out. <laughs> Order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.